We're taking our study this morning to the fourth of the seven churches in Asia Minor, covered in the book of Revelations, chapter 2 and 3. Today's study is the church at Thyatira, found in Revelations 2 and 18. And the angel and to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has the eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. But hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I want to speak to you this morning on the title, The Church with the Rotten Core. Father, we prepared our hearts and minds to minister today all of the five paragraphs of this letter that you've given to the church we're prepared to preach on. But Lord, something in my spirit welcomes you to interrupt. If it be your will at any point in this message, Lord, that you want to say something to us, I ask you to speak to my spirit that I may speak to your people and I ask that their pe the people's ears would be open to hear from the word of God, I ask you this for your glory and for your honor. Amen and amen. All of these seven letters have a common symmetry, as we've discussed earlier, five paragraphs. And we begin with the charge to write, where the Lord Jesus reveals to his bondservant John in the 18th verse, he says, and to the angel, to the angelos, to the messenger, the passenger, of the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones in Thyatira, right. And I want to remind you that all of these letters are written to three ear, groups of ears to hear. They are to the church practical, the church that literally existed in 96 AD of this writing, the church prophetic, the church age that each of these churches represent in the time of the Gentiles, and also to us personally today. He's speaking to Covenant Ministry Center and to our own individual personal hearts. Let's look first at this city called Thyatira. Like all the other cities, it was one of the seven cities of Asia Minor that the Lord wrote to in what is now called present-day Turkey. It is the smallest of all the cities written to, but yet it was the letter that was the longest that the Lord wrote to them. It was famous in its day for its commerce of wool and dye. It seems that there is a little small shellfish that grows nowhere else in the world except next to the coast of Thyatira. And from this little shellfish, they were able to get one drop of purple blood. And from this purple blood, they made a purple dye that was coveted by all the royals. This is where the color purple for royalty comes from. It was a very expensive dye that came from this little city of Thyatira. Also, they were known for their trade unions. The only way you could be a member of the trade union in Thyatira was to go once a year to the temple and speak your allegiance to the Dia Roma, or the God Rome, and there you could get your white stone so that you could go back and be able to buy and sell. It reminds me of a time that's coming not too many, men, too many days hence when no man might be able to buy or sell save he that has the mark, the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Now Thyatira, you might want to write this down in your Bibles. Thyatira means dominating 
female. Now, nothing could be more true to this church than it had a dominating female. In fact, the city of Thyatira had in their pagan worship a prophetess who sat in the temple of the god and this uh, of the god Apollo. And this prophetess supposedly was in some kind of trance, and she would be able to hear what God would say and give that word to the city. So it was the church, not wanting to be outdone by the world, had its own dominating female. And so we see that God is writing to this woman here, this woman he calls that woman Jezebel. But there was a dominating person in the church of Jesus Christ that was bringing forth false doctrine and bringing forth that you can eat meat off, offered to idols and you can have sexual immorality and sin. So it is also in the, in the Thyatirian age because John would later identify as we get into the book of Revelations what he calls Mystery Babylon the Great, the Great Harlot. You see, that is the church system that finally evolved down to the Roman Catholic Church and a church system that grabbed this church of Jesus Christ by the throat until it almost choked the very life out of it. A domineering female is what Thyatira, and so when we get to that in just a moment, you'll see how that all evolved. Now, God has chosen for some reason, and I don't know why, in his own wisdom, he has chosen the female gender to talk about his church. When Paul talks about his church, he talks about the bride of Christ, or the elect lady. But that elect lady is not to be a domineering female. She is to be submissive to the Lord Jesus Christ. And she is to be submissive to his spirit. You see, even to this very day, over in the Far East, when a couple gets married, when the, when the groom takes the veil, he does not only lift the veil, he removes the veil, and he puts it on his right shoulder. And by doing so, he is saying to that bride, from this moment forth, I am responsible for your care, for your feeding, and your protection. And But the fact that she lets him remove that and place it on his shoulder, she is saying, now I am under your authority, and I'm under your leadership, and that's the picture. But see, where there's always the real, Sister Flo, there's always the unreal, there's always the false. So we have Satan bringing forth the female character of the great whore, the harlot, which he identifies in Revelation as Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Females, the church... True and false. John says that even in verse seven, chapter 17 and 2, the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. You see, this mother of harlots will finally shove the church of Jesus Christ almost out of existence, bringing forth her seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, and leadership of man, instead of the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Are you hearing what I'm preaching to you today, church? I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ that he died for, that he bled and gave his life for, was almost crushed out of existence by the domineering spirit, false spirit of religion. Let's look at this little church practical here, the one that really existed. We don't know a lot about it, except that it was the hometown of Lydia a character in the Bible. We read about her in Acts chapter 16. It says, A certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple. Remember I told you they made purple there. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. And the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. We know that when Paul and Silas was broken out of jail, it was to Lydia's house they went. So I don't know if Lydia was the one that formed the church there or not. Maybe she was, maybe she wasn't, but I do know this for sure. Even if the church was formed by and founded by a woman, it was being confounded more by a woman. They, even it might have been given life by a submissive spirit of Lydia, a saint of God. It was being crushed out by the spirit of Jezebel, the dominating religious spirit that come upon the church of Jesus Christ. Let's talk a minute about the Thyatirian age. The church, all of these churches represent one of the church ages of the time of the Gentiles. The Thyatirian age lasted from 606 A.D. to 1517 A.D., 911 years. Now, if you've been following these teachings, you know that the Ephesonian age was about 130 years. 
Then the Sumerian age was about 150 years. Then the Pergamosian age was 299 years. And they are growing in length of time till they hit to this age and it lasts for 911 years. And from this time as we go forward, you will see the ages get shorter and shorter and shorter until we get to the Laodicean age in which we now live. And it will not be long until the Lord Jesus Christ comes for His church. 911 years from the time of 606 A.D. when the Pope stood and said that I am Pontificus Maximus and the Vicar of Christ. Up until that time, the Emperor of Rome only was called the Pontificus Maximus, meaning the great bridge builder. But when he gave way and got rid of that nomen for himself, the church reached out and grabbed the power. And the Pope stood and said, I am Pontificus Maximus. I am the great bridge builder. You come to me for the word. All the word comes through me. I will tell you what's right. I will tell you what's wrong. And he took the word of God from the people. And where in the New Testament books of Acts, this word of God was flowing through the churches. The word to Galatia and Colossians and Philippi and all of these words was just going through the church. And the church was growing and the church was being exalted. But all of a sudden, the word of God was gripped by a man and said, I'll tell you what you should believe. From that time until 1517, when a little woman named Martin Luther finally realized that the just shall live by faith, and he posted his thesis on the church at the Wittenberg Church, the cathedral in Wittenberg, Germany, and started the great Protestant or Protestant Reformation. We're talking about the Thyratarian Age which you studied in your history books in school, young people. It's known as the dark ages. You see, nothing good happens when the Word of God is not present. You squeeze out the Word of God, you squeeze out the life. It was the dark ages spiritually. It was the dark ages culturally. It was a dark ages scientifically. In 1500, people lived basically like they did in 600. No advancement in science. No advancement in intellect. No advancement in anything. You see, it's like before this world was created, and there was no light, and there was void and darkness on the face of the deep. So it was in the church age that I'm talking about when the Word of God was taken away from the people. There was a void. There was darkness. There was no light. There was no future. And there was no hope. The victim of progressive apostasy. Remember we talked about the church at Ephesus? That church that Jesus loved? That church had exploded with growth, but already before 30 years had passed, they were beginning to lose their first love. Then we talked about the Smyrnian age. Then we talked about the Perg- Perg- Pergamosian age, where the church married the world. And under Constantine, Catholicism and pagan ritualism was merged. And the Word of God began to disappear. But by the time we get here, the progressive doctrine of the Nicolaitans, antinomianism, what saved always saved, ecclesiastical order, synchronism with the world, the doctrine of Balaam, of greed, of disobedience and compromise, add to that the spirit of Jezebel, the spirit of the great whore. Total Roman Catholic and Greek Orthodox Catholic domination. If you were a Christian in this world for 911 years, you had to be Catholic. There was no other options. And the church almost ceased to exist. Pope Innocent III, boy, there's a misnomer of a name, Pope Innocent. He declared himself as the vicar of Christ. He said of himself, I'm the supreme sovereign over the church of the world. He insisted that he was the representative of the true body of Christ and that she is entirely seduced by the devil 
the word of God was taken out of the church. Listen, can I read from you from history here just a moment from Thomas Aquinas, one of the old church fathers that lived in the time of Pope Innocent III? And listen to this, church, listen to this. I'm reading verbatim. The Pope seems to those who view him with a spiritual eye to be not a man but a God. There are no bounds to his authority. He can declare to be right what he wills to be right. He can take away from any their rights as he sees fit. To doubt his universal power leads to being shut off from salvation. The church of Jesus Christ finally got to the place where if you didn't believe that the Pope was the only one that had the word, you were anathema, you were cut off, you were excommunicated, you had no hope and they had hid the word of God, and they brought in all these false doctrines. If you want to be saved, just bring your alms. You know, you can burn the more candles for a few pence. And they built their cathedrals in the time of the darkest hour. The greatest churches ever built, the church in Rome, the church in Florence, the cathedrals that are lifted their spire toward heaven were built at the very bottom of spirituality in the history of the church of God. Y'all hear what I'm saying to you this morning? During this same time, the great inquisition began by the popes. Now, I'm not making this stuff up, folks. It comes right out of the history books. You studied it in school, right? You ever heard of the great inquisition? Listen to what I'm about to tell you. 68 million Christians, your brothers and sisters in Christ, were executed by the Pope in those 911 years, averaging 75,000 people per year simply because they would not bow to Catholicism. Is that a dark time? During this same time, Islam was born. You see, if the church had remained the church. If the New Testament church, Brother David of Ephesus, had still been alive. If the word of God had still been going forth, there would have been no void and Islam would have never raised its head. But in this dark void, Satan brings forward his demonic antichrist spirit of Islam. And you listen to me. It makes me sick to my stomach to almost puke to see our supposedly Christian leaders in our Christian nations today whitewash their words just not to offend the Islamic spirit. I want you to know it is a spirit of Antichrist brought by Mohammed, a demonic devil, devil of hell. And their goal is to kill you. The church of Jesus Christ was brought to this nation by England. The church of Jesus Christ was brought to South America by Spain. Did you know that today there are more mosques in England and Spain than there are churches? And they're building mosques in our nation at a breakneck speed rate. And their goal is to execute you unless you bow down to Mohammed. God, give us a leader. God, give us a leader. But have no fear. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. I don't care what they bring against the church of Jesus Christ. There's going to be a remnant that still loves the Lord. Hallelujah. He will not share his place with anyone. He's a jealous God. Honor which belongs to him and him alone. He will not bestow upon another. He will not share his deity. Now, I told you that I would try to identify the messenger to all of these church ages. I'm not going to have a lot to say about this little age here because it was Catholic dominated. But they made one mistake, Brother David. They took a word away from the people. 
but they at least allowed their little priest to have the word. There's a little priest who was born in Ireland whose name was Columba. History says that he memorized the word of God verbatim from cover to cover. This little man decided he wouldn't listen to what's coming out of Rome. He wouldn't bow down to all their religious. And so the history records that Columba became a missionary and he evangelized all of Scotland, Ireland, and Northern Europe and many miracles were done in his hand. Now I don't know if he was the, the one or not, but I can't find any other in study that had any form of faith during these dark ages. Now we get to the charge to write. Having received the charge to write, we go to the identification of the sender, of the writer. Verse 18. These things says the Son of God, who his eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Now I'm not going to spend any time this morning on the eyes like a flame of fire. Buy a tape. It's on the other tape earlier on. I'm not going to speak about the feet like fine brass. His authority to judge. I've covered that. I've covered the penetrating eyes, the all-seeing eyes. But I'm going to hone in this morning because the Holy Spirit told me to hone in. On these things says the Son of God. You see, the church at Ephesus, he introduced himself to this church that he was pleased with. It was getting a little bit cold. He introduced himself as the one who has the angels in his right hand and he walks amidst the candlesticks or the lampstands. To the church at Smyrna, who was about to be almost executed out of existence and thrown to the lines, he introduced with hope when he said, I am the first and the last, one who was dead and now is alive. To the church at Pergamos that was marrying itself to the world, he says, let me remind you of the word. He introduced himself as the one who has a sharp two-edged sword. But to this church, he reminds them, I am the Son of God. Now what's he trying to say here? They had taken this free gift that my Savior had paid his life and his ransom for. They had put it back behind the veil. Now the priests, you had to go to the priest. You had to confess your sins. And if the priest thought everything was all right, he would go into the holies of holies or supposedly into the altar. And the Lord is saying here, you don't have to say, Hail Mary, Mother of God, bless us now in the time of our death. You can go boldly into the throne room of God because He took His little finger and He ripped the veil from the top to the bottom. And we have access into the presence of the Son of the living God. There's a whole lot more here the Spirit said to me this week. You see, we like to think of him as a son of man, don't we? We think of Jesus. Every time you think of Jesus, I know you do, because I do. You think of him, he's a son of man. He's, that's the picture. All through the Scriptures, he introduces himself as the son of man. You see, as the son of a man, he went through the earth healing Raising the dead, feeding the thousands. The Son of Man. When he ascended to the right hand of the Father, Elijah and Moses stood there and said, You men, why are you looking up into the heavens? Don't you know this same Jesus will come in like manner as you see him go? This Son of Man. But we are not today to think of him, Sister Flo. He has ascended to the right hand of the Father, and he is not the Son of Man, but he is the Son of God. Now, we have a wrong conception, church, about the Trinity. Am I the teaching pastor? Be all right if I teach a little bit. It's in your DNA. I know how you think because I have the same tendencies. We're human beings, and when we speak of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, we automatically think Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's just natural to think that way. But that's not the way it is. You may even think Father, 
Son, and Holy Ghost. It's not even that way. It is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You see, we believe our doctrine of faith. We believe in one God, eternally existing in three persons, namely God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Now, my challenge this morning is to get that from here to here. God has worked with me this week about this Son of God thing. And I hope he'll give me the words of this faltering old man to get through to you what the Holy Ghost has shown me this week. You see, he is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and they three are one. Here to here. Now I'm going to ask the sister to help me with some Bible scriptures this morning. And pastor, I've got all five paragraphs prepared, but I may not get no further than right here. Will you please, in your Bibles, open with me to 2 Corinthians 5, 16. And if you're up there, sister, would you put it on the board? I'll be reading from the New King James Version. You don't have 2 Corinthians 5, 16? Put it up in the, just King James then. That'll be fine. I'll be reading from the New King James. 2 Corinthians 5, 16, in the middle of the, in the, middle of the verse... Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Is that what the word says? Even though we think of him as the son of man, even though our image of him is the one going around doing these miracle works in the flesh, now Paul says we knew him and have known him in the flesh, but according to the flesh. Yet now we know him thus no longer. Turn with me please to 1 Corinthians 15 and 45. 1 Corinthians 15 and 45. Holy Spirit help me here. 1 Corinthians 15 and 45 the word says, And so it is written, the first man, Adam, and Adam, by the way, means man. The first man, man, Adam, became a living being. Was made, it said. Or became, it says in my version, a living being. Now you all know that Adam was made out of the dust of the field. And the Holy Spirit breathed on him and he became a living being. Look what it says about the second Adam. The last Adam, who is that? Jesus Christ, the last man, the son of man, the last Adam became or was made a life-giving spirit. Now, have I already taught you and over and over again how that he came into this world, a little baby like those babies in there, and he grew in knowledge and wisdom and stature? He became a life-giving spirit. But that's not the end of the story. Let me get my glasses here. I want you to go now to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, and we're going to stay right there a while. God's wanting us to understand something this morning. I hope he'll give this old man enough wisdom to get it through to you. John chapter 14. And let me put the setting for you. Jesus is about to be taken up by the Father to heaven. He's been for three years ministering here with his disciples and doing all those great works that we know about, healing the sick, raising the dead, feeding the thousands. But he's about to go home. And he says to his disciples, he says in Brother David in John 14 and 1, let not your heart be troubled. One version says, neither let it be afraid. But he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go. Let's stop right there a minute. He's saying to them, fellas, listen. I've been living with you now for three years. And it's time for me to go. He says, I go. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, 
I will come again. You just missed a shouting place, church. Would you say it with me? I will come again. Would you say glory to God? Would you say hallelujah? Would you say thank you, Jesus? He said, I'm going to go, boys, but I'm going to come again. And I will receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also. Now look at verse 4. Look at carefully. And where I go you know, and the way you know. He was saying, fellas, I've lived here with you now for three years. You've seen my ministry. I'm about to go home, and you know the way to get where I'm going. But look at verse 5. What does Thomas say? Very verse, very next verse. Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Now, what did the Lord just say in verse 4? Where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas, who had sat by the side of Jesus for three years and had seen the sweat fall off of his brow like mine is now, had seen him in chills when he was cold, but had also seen him do the miracles of raising the dead and walking on the water, says, how can we know the way? And what does Jesus say in the next verse? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, Thomas, listen. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Thomas, listen. Standing right here in front of you is the Son of Man, Jesus. You've seen me do these miracles. And you haven't recognized the Father that's in me. You think there's some kind of hero, charismatic man personality among you. You think there's some hero that can hit you on the head and make you fall or all of those things that's among you. But he said, Thomas, if you'd just open your eyes and understand God has been standing in front of you all the time. Are y'all getting this? Yeah. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you have known him and have seen him. Well, I thought no one has ever seen the Father. No one's ever seen his glory. But he was wrapped in human flesh. But he was indeed the 100% Son of God. 100% man. Now this don't make sense in your mathematics, does it? 100% man and 100% God. Figure that out in your finite mind if you can. And look at verse 9. Verse 8. Philip chimes in. And Philip says to him, Lord, show us the Father and it will be sufficient for us. Come on, church, stay with me now. We're getting to some deep things of God right here. He had just said, Philip, Thomas, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Lord, show us the Father, and it'll be sufficient. Listen, they'd been with him three years, and they didn't get it. And some of us have been with him 30 or 40 years, and we still don't get it. Not a fairy tale. He was the Son of God. Look at verse 9. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, Show us the Father? I've been standing here in front of you as the Father, the Son of God, for three years. One God. Three personalities. Verse 10, do not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Listen, Philip, 
Listen, James. Listen, John. You've seen this man of flesh minister in your presence for three years. And you've missed the whole point, boys. The words that I speak are not the words coming out of the Son of Man. They are the words that are coming out of the Son of God because God is in me. And the miracles that you've seen when I've laid my hands is not the works of a man of flesh, but is the works of the God that is within me. We ain't through yet. I don't do this in my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Yeah, he says if you can't believe that, else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. I mean, you've seen all these things. If you can't believe what I'm saying, just go back in your memory and remember when we fed 15,000, 5,000 men and 10,000 women and children with just a few little loaves and fishes. And if, you can't, if that's not good enough, remember when we laid hands on Jairus' daughter and she rose from the dead. And if that's not good enough for you, remember when I stepped out on the sea and walked on the water. Remember, I'm the Son of God. Well, it's going to get better, folks. Most assuredly, I say to you, verse 12, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to my Father. Now, Let's get real. How many in this church has that sentence I just read in your presence ever bothered you? There's one honest man. Here's a few others. You know, this word is true or it's a lie. You got to make a choice right here. Now, if the sick come up here and I lay my hands on them and they are not healed, it's not this word's fault. The fault is in Hugh Statham. Hello? When you lay your hands on the sick and they don't recover, the fault is not the word. The fault is you. Are we getting real here yet? Yes, Let's go on. He said greater works than these. Boy, I've heard every preacher, I've heard preachers try to explain that away. I'm not going to try to explain it away anymore, folks. I'm just going to put the bare bones out in front of you. If I don't do the work, it's because I've still got a something that Jesus is working on in my life that needs to be dealt with. And if you can't get it done, it's because something is in your life that needs to be dealt with. There's something in our life that needs to be dealt with. He said, greater works than this I'll do because I go back to the Father. What's he saying? He's saying, boys, I am limited to this Veil of flesh. How many miracles have you done up to this point, James and John and Peter? How many have you done? You done any miracles yet, fellas? No, you've been following me around, ushering around the crowd and picking up the trash around the baskets. But you haven't done any works of miracles. Why? Because you're waiting on me. I'm the one who has the Son of God in me. But what have you got in you? You've got nothing but the arm of flesh in you. He said, that's why it's necessary I go back to my Father. For if I go, I'll come again. Oh, Sister Flo, this is so good. It's so deep. You see, verse 13, And whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. 
If you love me, keep my commandments. Let me tell you why miracles are not done in the churches today like they were when I was a boy and like they were in the New Testament church is because we don't keep the commandments of God. We have other gods before him. We don't keep the Sabbath day and keep it holy. We don't love our neighbor like ourself. And on and on and on. But look, pastors, it's okay what I'm doing. John 14. Look what he says. The church, please get this. I'm not going to finish this message this morning. The Holy Ghost just told me I'm not going to. I'm going to have to nail it down right here. Listen, John 14. I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper or comforter. That he, who? He, who? The comforter may abide with you how long? Boys, I've been with you for three and a half years. I've been on this earth 33 years as a son of man. The first 12, I didn't know I was a son of God. I grew in wisdom and that stature, and I've learned, and I've been tested, and now I've been with you three years, and I've got to go away that he may come, but he will never leave you nor forsake you, but he will be with you to the end. But look at this now. Look at the next very thing. He says, even the spirit of truth. Who is the spirit of truth? Oh, come on. Verse 6, what did he say? I am the way, the truth. So here, who is the spirit of truth? It is the spirit of Christ. Boys, it's not good I stay here with you. I go to the Father, and I present myself to the Father, and I come again in the form of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of Jesus Christ will be in you. Whom the world cannot receive. Cosmos. World system. Worldliness. I'm coming back, boys. But the world cannot receive me. If there's sin in your life, you can't receive me. If you fail to keep my commandments, you can't receive me. You can babble in tongues till you're blue in the face, but you will not have received me. If there is impurity in your life, you have not received me. This is the way to empty a church, preacher, right here. Here's what I'm doing. The world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But look here. He's still talking to the disciples. You know him. I'm standing here in front of you. He dwells with you. Who? The Spirit of truth. I'm still standing here in front of you. The Spirit of truth. I dwell with you. You know him. But he will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. Who will come to you? What's he say? I. The Holy Spirit? No. He said, I. I. Ah, ah, the spirit of truth, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. We three are one. I was in the flesh as a man. You didn't recognize I was a father. I'm coming to you in the spirit, and you won't even recognize it. It's the spirit of your loving Lord Jesus Christ living in your breast. I will not leave you orphans, but I will come to you. A little while longer and the world will see me no more. The Son of Man is about to go back into heaven. 
but you will see me because I live, you should live also. Now get this, and I'm going to get out of here. And the day, at that day, the day I send the, my spirit back to you, at that day you will know that I am in my Father and you are in me, and I am in you, and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and you will be one! Thank you, Lord. Everybody's got a favorite verse of Scripture. Maybe yours is John 3, 16. Mine is Philippians 3, 10. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. That I may know him. You know Pastor Thompson? You know him? How about Sister Peter? You know her? See, that's not what he's talking about here, folks. He says that I may gnostos, that I may know him. When I was in love, I'm still in love, by the way. And I married this woman. I wanted to know her. I wanted to go into her. I wanted to know her passionately. I wanted to know her emotionally. I wanted to know everything there is about her. That's the very word that he's using. Not some kind of sexually deviant thing, folks. He's saying, Paul is saying that I may know the Lord Jesus Christ intimately and passionately and emotionally. And when I know him that way, I can know him in the power of his resurrection. But more than that, I will even be pleased to know him in the fellowship not the trial, not the persecution, but the joy of his suffering. Is this okay, folks? It is, absolutely. <laughs> that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship. You see, when I know him like I'm supposed to know him, my heart bleeds for the lost like his does. When I know him that way, my heart rejoices when the lost come in. Amen. When I was a boy, and I'm sorry about going back to my childhood, folks, but I've seen some things. What? When I was a boy, and someone came to the mourner's bitch, the saints fell in around behind them. Amen. And we prayed them through to victory if it took all night. You know I'm telling the truth. We stayed there till midnight. You see, we're not talking about some little mouth conversion here. We're talking about becoming a new creature in Christ. But today, I'll guarantee you this morning, and I know I've been anointed. Someone comes to this altar, we'll beat a trail out of here to get to the restaurant. You know why we don't have Christ's passion in us anymore? My God, I'm sorry, but I'm just telling the truth. I can't deliver the sick because I still have sin in my life. I still have things God's dealing with. You can't, I can't, we can't. He's working on us all. Now, I want to tell you something what God's doing in this little church right here. I cannot speak for any other church, but I can speak because God has revealed it to me. We're a few. Used to be a big church. Brother David had a big church. In my flesh, Sister Flo, I would love to see the walls overflow. I know Pastor Thompson would too. But in my prayer this week, 
God told me, he said, that's not what I'm trying to do at Covenant Ministry Center, son. You see, he didn't wake up an old broken down this preacher that had been 21 years retired over here somewhere and bring him back into this pulpit just for fun. He didn't reach down into prison and get a hold of Jerry Upton who had been seven years in the trial for fun. He didn't give us a pastor that will share his pulpit Sunday morning and Sunday night and you can't find any others that would for fun. Let me tell you what he's doing, and I can't speak for any other church. But he's trying to create something here that you cannot find in any church in this county or in Knox County or anywhere around. He's trying to find a church that is pure. It may be, Abraham, can you find a hundred? No, Lord. Abraham, can you find fifty? No, Lord. Abraham, can you find ten? No, Lord. What God is doing at Covenant Ministry Center, and I don't know if he'll succeed because it depends a lot on us. God, and folks, I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not, please don't take this wrong. You cannot go anywhere within driving distance and hear the word preached like it's coming from this pulpit on Sunday morning and Sunday night, and I'm not saying that for my own pleasure. That is the truth. Jerry Upton is an anointed man of God. God has re-anointed my flesh. And the word is being preached. And it's being preached without compromise. And God is trying to raise a holy church. March the 5th of this year. Some of you might have been here the first time I stood in the pulpit in 21 years. On March the 5th, the Holy Ghost reminded me that I'm not going to live long. And I have a few days that I can give him. And he told me to go bring this message to you, two things, and I preached it over and over again from this pulpit. There's false doctrine in the church. Have you heard me expound that over and over? Folks, there's people preaching stuff. They're winking at this and they're winking at that and they're winking at the world and they're just lullabying you right into hell. He said the other things is to blow is tell them I'm coming soon. Get their garments washed. Get them clean. Because I'm coming after a spotless bride. I'm not going to take the dirt with me when I come. I don't care who's led you into believing it. He's not going to take the compromising church when he comes. He's coming after a bride that's spotless and is looking for him. Give me some music, please. I'm through preaching. I didn't even get half through with this sermon, but I got as far as the Holy Ghost wanted me to get. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, what do you want us to do? Pastor, he wants to do miracles in our midst. He hadn't changed. He's not a respecter of persons. What happened to Peter and James and John before the Holy Spirit came? They could do no works, but they finally got it. You see, when the Holy Spirit, they had a 10-day prayer meeting. Brother Mike, they had a 10-day prayer meeting. 
And they finally got it. And when the Spirit of Christ came in, they had so much God on them when they walked by, people were healed. Would you stand with me, please, church?